Being a Christian woman and walking in God's calling for our lives can be a difficult task. With the world and pop culture telling us to be one way, and the Bible saying another, you kind of end up feeling like an other. Well, you're not alone. Join me now and my friends as we navigate life in our 20s and 30s, while making sure we live out our faith, embrace our femininity, and looking cute. We discuss pop culture, life, careers, relationships, and so much more. Prepare to be entertained and educated. I know you're going to love it. Join our movement and embrace being another girl. The views expressed on this podcast are our own and do not reflect our employers. Enjoy. Everyone, you are listening to Those Are the Girls with Mallory and Friends. I'm Mallory. And I'm Jamie. And we are changing culture and bringing back traditional values. Welcome back. I finally have another co-host. I look at the analytics and everybody does like when I have a another co-host. Um, so I will try to keep bringing people on. Jamie actually was also requested. I want to say like last episode you were on, someone did comment on the Spotify. Please have her on again. So she's back. Oh. Everybody. Yeah. Legitimately, someone said, please have her on again. Oh, thank you. Well, I have returned at your request. <laughs> so we have some interesting stories to talk about. It's going to be a, kind of like a different TCAP. There hasn't really been too much. I'm saying we're recording this on Wednesday. I'm sh- like, this is going to be come out on Monday and I'm sure something's going to happen just the way luck works. I'm in the next couple of days. We're like, ah, um, but nothing really as crazy has happened. Um, but we do have some things that we must discuss. But before we do that, everyone, I want to remind you of tea party june 1st if you live in the charlotte area or if you're coming to the charlotte area around june 1st we're doing a tea party at a cause for tea which is a really cute tea house and we're going to be dressing up looking cute taking pictures and we're also going to be talking about what does it mean to be a real girl's girl in today's culture as a christian because we know that culture and we talk about it here on the podcast you can go on twitter and even see it we know that the world has an idea of what a girl's girl is and sure there probably are some things that are noble and fine but we need to figure out as christians what is a girl's girl because that is our worldview and that is how we should be viewing the lens that's how we should be viewing our fellow sisters so we'll be talking about that on june 1st um i think those are all the announcements yeah i think that's it so, Jamie, are you ready to, like, just dive in? I am ready. Okay. The first thing I want to talk about, and we kind of, I do this with everybody that I have on as a guest as friends. We kind of, like, talk for an hour, sometimes two hours before, um, and then we start recording. So, we kind of talked a little bit about this, but hopefully we'll still continue to be funny talking about it again. Um, so, the first and only article, really, that I am going to read is um, from the New York Post, and the title is None of Forbes Billionaires Are Under 30. Okay, let me read that again. None of Forbes Billionaires Under 30 are self-made for the first time in 15 years. Their bank accounts are stacked with family money. For the first time since 2009, none of those who made Forbes' list of billionaires under 30 generated their massive wealth on their own. This year, 18 of the 25 youngest of the world's Billionaire list inherited their wealth. The statistic is partly due to self-made billionaires aging into their 30s and not being replaced by others in the same financial situation. The business magazine reported in an article titled World's Youngest Billionaires 2024. The hefty inheritances are also the start of what the outlet calls a, quote, long anticipated generational wealth transfer, end quote. Trillions are expected to change hands every year as the affluent elderly pass away and leave their fortunes to descendants. Okay, wait, side note. I don't know if you remember this. A couple years. Um, okay, wait, no. Just remind me, I have something about billionaires dying to say. Just remind me. Let me finish. Sorry, sorry, everybody. <laughs> the title of the youngest billionaire in the world goes to 19-year-old Livia Vagati of Brazil. The college student who has a network of $1.1 billion has a minority stake in her late grandfather's electrical equipment production company, WEG. I feel like I don't know what that is, but like I've seen it places. She was accompanied on the list by her older sister, Dora, who was 26. 
a pair of 20 something billionaire brothers from Ireland also made the list. Zahn and Frizz Mystery are estimated to have a net worth of a staggering 4.9 billion each. And the duo are 27, 25 and 27, respectively. They're the sons of the late. Cyrus Mystery, former chairperson of Indian India's largest conglomerate, the Tata Group. Um, let me see here. Oh, Clementine Vahicho, 19. She earned a stake in Elisior Lux Tata, the Italian French maker of Ray Ban, after his dad died. Let me just see if there's anybody else that like we would all know. Um, no, there's no other that like really big brands. Um, so yeah, so what I really wanted to say, cause, and we were talking about, um, so before you guys, we were talking about billionaires and like how, for example, like these people, I don't know their names. Like we don't know, like the really, really, really rich people, we probably don't know. And we probably never really will know. Mm hmm I recognize Ray-Ban because that's just like a classic thing, but everything else, I was just like, I don't know what that is. Well, I don't know if you remember this. I want to say a year, maybe even two years ago. People noticed that a, a large chunk, like billions of dollars, was either reported or left to the IRS, which meant some sort of billionaire had died. Like somehow people who like are into that stuff, they saw it and, they, and the conclusion came to a billionaire had died. And I don't think they ever found out who it was because, like, they tried to figure out who it was. But once again, these people aren't really, they're not famous. They're not, they don't have, like, Twitters and they're not trying to, you know, go to the moon. So we don't really know who they are. I just found that interesting. What did you, what were your thoughts when you heard that um, most of them, none of them are self-made? Well, first of all, I didn't know about the dying billionaire, but that, that's wild um, yeah. that nobody was able to figure out who that person was. But I think that's what I've noticed about the absolute richest of the rich is that they don't want to be known. They Which don't smart. have the, the same needs as say people who like they want to get rich and famous, that type of person. The people who are extremely wealthy have been wealthy for generations. They don't need to get famous to fill up their confidence and get validation. They know they know that they're the best people because they've been literally told for generations that they're the best. Mm -hmm. Their dad has been told that he's the best, his dad and his dad and his dad. So when you meet a truly wealthy, wealthy person, they are not the slightest bit insecure because it is, there's nobody in their family who's dealt with needing to be validated by others. They just paid for things. They yeah. felt validated in their wealth. And so you won't know those, those people's names, the people that people think of as like the rich people, the celebrity is like, I'm telling you as somebody who worked with celebrities too, these people do not have the money you think they have. And, um, and they make that very clear in the way that they pay people. And mm -hmm. when you try to fight for more, you actually understand the limitations that they have financially. And you're like, wow, like, you know, you're on this big show, but like, this is the only house you can afford. And yeah, it's a nice house. And yeah, it's in a great location. But I think in people's minds, they're like, oh, you have this like, huge, gorgeous house in Hollywood. And so you have like, a stacked bank account, like to you, there's no limits. But these people, while they have a lot more than a lot of people do, they're by no means anywhere close to limitless. And so I think the issue is when you have people like going after like, oh, these are the wealthy, you're going to miss the true wealth, which are actually yeah. the people who are truly running things. Um, and those are people that like, they're the ones that get involved in government. They're the ones that are hiding their money in different countries and different banks. Um, and so to, to find out, and circling this back to the actual subject at hand, to find out that there are no self-made was it billionaires or was it millionaires yeah, billion billionaires no self-made billionaires under 30 um makes absolute sense unfortunately especially as somebody who also like i work at a company where my boss will tell all the people like hey this tax is really difficult for us 
to take. Like where it's really hard to build. It's really hard to be an American based brand with these taxes or these limitations, whatever it is. When you put all these limitations on, on businesses and tax them, it just becomes hard to be an entrepreneur, which makes it hard for you to make your own money in any way other than being born into it and being taught by those people like, hey, here's our money and here's how you invest. I'm glad more people are learning about investing, but investing is also, it necessitates that you have money to invest with. So people Absolutely. who win big already have a lot of money to play the game with in the first place. Absolutely. And, and um, I think it's unfortunate, but at the end of the day, people not understanding how wealth is built and then blaming the wrong people and then voting accordingly has caused all of the problems that we're seeing where people aren't actually creating companies that are getting big and giving them money that they very well deserved. Like, I, th I think it's also really ridiculous how people are like blaming business owners or feeling like, oh, the, the big bad, whether it's like Walmart or the big bad, like, I, I just watched You've Got Mail last night. Like, so it, just, it feels like, oh, the big bad Fox books. But <laughs> all these people are very smart at business. And unfortunately, I must tell you that Joe Fox runs a better business than Meg Ryan. Um, just like the way that he scaled his business was just very well done. And that's why he makes money. And it's the same thing with, um, you know, American companies. I think we can actually say the Walton family who own Walmart, they are very smart in the way that they did that business and maybe they deserved all that success. And so, um, yeah, unfortunately I think a lot of bureaucracy has changed things in this country. Uh, but anybody who watches this podcast knows that and you're on the same page as us. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to piggyback what you said about entrepreneurship. I think entrepreneurship was and it still can be. I do think, like, I'm not one of those people, their American dream is dead. Oh, I don't feel that way at all. But I definitely feel like it's definitely not my grandparents' American dream. Um, but, and, you know, even thinking about, like, my grandparents' American dream, especially, you know, as someone who's Black, it, they have seen so much growth, especially, like, you know, my brother and I, my parents, college graduate, anyway, it they have seen so much growth in their small amount of time um like you know my great grandparents probably never imagined that i could have a podcast where i finance it myself and i have people listening to me that aren't even like put race back in there that aren't even like my same race like so that dream that they have is like it's been ex uh, exponential now the dream that like we have is just so um it's possible you know like but i i do think it's a little bit more difficult um just because like you said like some of the taxes the economy i was listening to um breaking points which i'll link there i did a segment on this and sagar made a really good point he was like there is people should not have to take out a sec or like do a second job to pay their rent that has been the same or that has gone up the last five years. That is a sign of like a weak economy. Mm -hmm. It's There's nothing wrong with having to take a second job if you want to go on a vacation. That's kind of noble. That shows you're working hard. You understand that. But if you have not really changed anything, then there's no reason for you. You should not have to take a second job. There was also this article. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I should have looked at it. But there was an article they were talking about where it was like the new millennials, new luxury are groceries. And it's like, that shouldn't be a luxury. And don't get me started on like eating healthy. Like, I mean, people can oh, say, oh, well, oh. it's one thing that, um, and kind of what you were saying about, you have to have the money to invest. It also made me think of this too. Like it, it all is like, they say, for example, oh, if you invest more into eating healthy, then you will be a, you won't have to pay these terrible medical bills later that's absolutely true but you have to have the money now like that's what i think people don't understand like you sure but like mary sue whose husband has died and they were living paycheck to paycheck and she doesn't have he some, a lot of people believe this or not a lot of people they don't have like uh, life insurance they don't have like extra money what you do is you go to your family members and say hey can you chip in to help bury this person because 
you don't have, they don't even have money to be buried. So there's people living in America like that for those that don't know. So, you know, Mary Sue, she has to take care of her five kids or I'll say two kids even. It costs less to stop by McDonald's really quick than and make a and get a burger from there than to get all the ingredients to make a burger. Sure, it's gonna if you get the ingredients, it's gonna last longer. But the problem is she doesn't have the money right now to even do that. All she has is three dollars. What can she get for three dollars? That's healthy. The only thing she can get is like a something from the dollar menu. Anyway, that's like you know that's a whole nother rant. But with the investing, like I. Growing up, I didn't know about investing. That wasn't really a thing we talked about. And investing is great, like you said, but you have to have like money to invest. I have a little, I use this app that's like for women, by women. It's kind of corny. I'm not going to lie, but um, it's cute. And, you know, anything with pink and for women, I kind of just, okay, I'll do it. And they like, I put $100 in a month and they invest for me, right? The reality is the girls who are putting in $6,000 a month are getting probably like millions more, maybe not millions, but hundreds of thousands more money than I do with my little hundred. Like a hundred from what I'm seeing isn't making a real dent. It's almost just like a savings for me at this point Um, because you have to have like to make money, you have to have money to start a business. For those that don't know, I have a jewelry business, shopthepinkrose.com. You have to have the money to buy the materials to buy the supplies Mm -hmm. so uh, now i don't know why i'm on this rant and in regards to it makes sense starting a business is costly so if if we're talking about self-made people (laughs) who are under 30 you need to have enough money to actually create the business and just as an example this was only i don't know within the past eight it was eight or ten years ago i had a friend who started a skincare company it's actually a brilliant skincare company. Um, but she was going back and forth with a chemist to, to, um, make the formula of like one product. This is one product we're talking. She has, I think six products in the line or something like that, maybe more now, but this is just one product. Okay. And I, I just, as an aside, I will say when you are making a product with a lab, um, you will find that you need to go back and forth a few times before you get things the way you want them as good as you want them Mm -hmm. so when people ask me oh jay like what's the like best mascara at the drugstore i will say this about every um every product that you put on your face it's like performance based whoever has the most money wins because you need money to go back and forth to the lab and say like i pay the scientist again to reformulate Mm -hmm. and pay um the the cost of like the time and the the material for all of that to be remade and then the packaging for it a whole separate story so when it comes to like the best products at the drugstore people are always like oh like wow maybelline makes great products well of course maybelline makes great products maybelline is a huge company they have endless amounts of money they're owned by l'oreal l'oreal also owns redken and garnier fructis and oh uh, i didn't know they own maybelline yeah, they own L'Oreal. they own oh. Maybelline. They also own Lancome. So wow, a lot they of say- formulas of, of <laughs> Lancome mascaras mascaras between Lancome and L'Oreal are the, very similar or the same product because oh, it's wow. the same company. Yeah. So most cosmetics, like company wise, are if they're not self owned, they're either owned by L'Oreal or Estee Lauder. Those are the big companies in the in the makeup uh, game, and they're just kind of trying to do different price points. Same formula, just different price points. That's a tip, everyone. Yeah. You're paying extra for some of the stuff, but if it's owned by the same company, it's the same product. Interesting. It, I will say there's a difference if there are skincare ingredients because the ingredients in skincare are expensive because they are they're hard to find. They're also sensitive to the way they're packaged and the way they're kept. Um, so skincare spend money, but makeup maybe don't. Yeah. Uh, but I I will say what like like I said, with performance-based products that go on the face, whoever has the most money wins because you're going back and forth with a lab. And so my friend, she's starting this company, right? So she's one product. She wasn't even done with the formula. This was, I think at this point, it was either the first or second time she'd sent the product to the lab. I think she sent it back three or four times because she was particular, wanted to get this product so that she could say, hey, I actually, I made this product and I love this product and not just sell you something because she wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. So this is, 
one product, maybe once or twice to lab, $36,000. Oh my goodness. That's and this crazy. Is, and this is eight or so years ago. So it's more now. $36,000 oh, one product. 36. And so whenever people be like, Jay, start a skincare line. You'd be so good at that. $36,000 one product. I do not have $36,000 to to bring to a lab once and I know I would send it back at least seven times yeah that's crazy and I think that's something that people don't know and realize like I listen to a lot of entrepreneur podcasts just because like you know I'm an entrepreneur um and um what people don't realize is people invest a lot of money there are outliers of course that you know there's outliers but like like the majority you have to already have money that is something I learned I was listening to um a, a boys lie do you know that brand boys lie I've heard of it but I'm not familiar they like started off as makeup I think and then they did t-shirts anyway they were honest they said that they oh goodness I think it was like fifty thousand dollars from like friends and family which first of all I I don't know people like that, but she, they said it was straight up just friends and family all together gave them $50,000. So, and that's how, and because of that, they're a, they were able to get their products and do marketing and do X, Y, and Z. They, there was a huge mix up with the shipment of something. And like, you know, a right, like me, like if something's wrong with a shipment of jewelry that I get, or even like supplies, I also do custom pieces sometimes. If something's wrong with that shipment, that's like, oh my goodness, I have to do more. But she said, because they had that money, they were like, oh man, well, let's do it again. You know, like money is like, it makes the difference. And I think, um, I guess to tie it back into the self-made thing, um, I think it's just a sign of like how the economy is going. I don't think that we're in a downward spiral and that spiral <laughs> will never get back. I just think, bless you. Thank I you. just <laughs> think that like, we are in a time where, um, I guess a testing time where like in, I don't know if it's an official recession or anything like that, but like, we're not in our best. We're not doing our best. I'll just put it that we, way. We it, this better is a in sign the past, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've looked better in our past. Um, and this is just a sign of the times that like, and I think also it was interesting. The article mentioned that, um, for example, like Zuckerberg and, um, some of the tech guys, I was just listening to, um, or like the guy who created Uber, all of them, they're not on the list because they've aged, which also makes you think like, when was the last time, um, you, there was like a, a major tech company that shifted the culture. When was the last time? Do you think that, I think two things also might factor into this. Do you think that one, the lack of work ethic in younger generations plays into this? And two, do you also possibly think that I, I think like we've been sold a, a lie uh, about where we're at as a, as a world um, ecologically. Like, hmm. I, I think that there has been this, like what, like the state of the planet, as far as it's, it's health, like whatever you believe I do think it's been I think we can maybe agree it's been exaggerated as to like how close the world is to like nature exploding yeah. and I think when we saw what happened with COVID like we didn't go outside for two weeks and already like plants were like we're back and like the dolphins were swimming the Venice canals and we're like we love it here oh the deer were like having a field day where I am <laughs> they were all the animals were acting different good point nature good came point. back like that two weeks yeah <laughs> Two weeks we were out. Yeah. So I, I think that there's been a mass exaggeration about like the, the state of the world. And I think there are a lot of young people in stress, like it's the end of the world. Why bother doing anything? Yeah. Does that factor in as well? Do you think? <sighs> Good question. Cause there are a lot of people who are, who feel, feel very doom and gloom about it all. If you, and that kind of goes back, I think to social media which was made by these tech people that didn't, you know, <laughs> pave the way for new tech. Um, but I, you know, that could have something to do with it. Like there are a lot of people who doom and gloom and there are people who I think are, I hate saying that 
because like I would probably put millennials in this not all but like some millennials in this and gen z like i hate saying that like our generation is lazy because i but i don't i don't know what other word it is for what i think the problem the lethargicness of it is because there are so many people who are kind of complacent you know some people who kind of don't want to do anything innovative people who just stay go to work play video games all day go to bed that's like there. And if you're doing that and you don't have time to be creative, I don't even think you necessarily have to start a business, but like, if you don't have time to go outside, like ride your bike, paint, you know, meet up with friends for coffee, go to your Bible study. I do think those things affect all of it. I think it's all kind of connected in some way. I think so I don't as know, maybe well. It does. Our generation, millennials and on, have never been more aware of the stress that they deal with and also have so many external stressors put on them, things that they Ooh, this can't is a good point control. Too. And like yeah. in previous generations, like you'd hear mostly local news and it was stuff that you could contribute to or help. Whereas now we're getting hit with, um, this is happening in um the middle east and this is happening in asia like whatever and you're getting hit with it but then also there are a lot of people that want to put guilt and shame on people for not doing enough they're like you're not doing enough there are people suffering hundreds and thousands of miles from here and then there's all this like weight put on these generations younger uh older generations didn't have to deal with this not only because they didn't know about it but also those expectations weren't on them they were like oh is this happening in our community let's see how we can help whereas they would hear something like that happens very far away they're like well we can't do anything about that but what can we do we can serve our community we can deal with our own issues and so i think that that combination of a lot being put on the younger generations and the weird morality that um, the younger generations have that like what makes someone a good person ends up being like what you believe and 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 you speak up about, on this yeah it's more about you speaking than doing anything so 100 percent. Our, our generations have been taught like oh the right thing to do is post a black square on your instagram tile and do absolutely nothing else um right. if you didn't post a black square you're a horrible person um some of the meanest I, almost racist people did it but anyway that's <laughs> that's another conversation <laughs> Exactly. It's like, that's, that's their version of morality rather than doing something like my great grandfather said some maybe like questionable things about women, I will say like, but he was born in 1912. And he's dead. Right. So we're gonna give right. him a pass. But he would say certain things like, you know, about women like being in politics and how he didn't think they should be in politics or like whatever. But my great grandfather also started the first low income housing for senior citizens in my hometown. Wow. And there's okay. a street named after him for it in this neighborhood. That's cool. So there are all these people that like the younger generations demonize. They're like, you have backwards beliefs. I'm like, these people built something that helped people. And just to Sit piggyback off down. of <laughs> yeah, No, seriously. And to piggyback off of like that little that point right there. I think like we have got to realize everyone is multifaceted. Like this is I'm gonna quote Bojack Horseman again, and I know people are probably like, oh my goodness, this girl's obsessed with that show, but there's just such good quotable things. Um, Diane in an episode says she doesn't believe that people are good or bad. They just do good or bad things. And I think and I have actually been thinking that. I don't necessarily know how spiritual that is, but like for me, at least, like thinking like that, like releases. So actually, you know what? That is a Christian belief because we're all sinners, no matter like who you are. Like, I'm just as much as a sinner as a murderer. Like, I'm just I'm not a murderer, but I, sin still separates you from God. Anyway, my point is, though, like if we learn that, like people are just so most faceted, like you don't then it'll release you from like thinking someone has to be perfect and like sign every petition you put across or like you know people that well let me i don't know if i can support this person let me see what they said about this latest thing that that just happened you can release yourself from that if you go but you know what like this person like oh just use your great grandfather this person actually made a huge difference i don't agree with some of his beliefs over here but he actually made a huge difference so let me 
recognize him for that. And then I, we just won't discuss women in politics. Like, I just think we need to like, let go. There's, I mean, people do this with celebrities all the time. And like the fake, like, um, well, we, you have to do something. I hate when someone goes, no one's talking about X, Y, and Z. Either A, everyone's talking about it, or B, we have never heard it. How can we be talking about something if we have never heard on Twitter? Mm -hmm. That is like my, it will irk me. It almost will get me to block you. Like, I can't stand that. No one's talking about this super obscure thing that happened and this really thing. And it's probably a terrible, awful thing. But like, I, I can't speak out or like, I can't comment on something I don't know about. We have this and that huge, you don't know the intricacies yeah. of because how many times have you said something and that, like I have a friend who like she because she's like Russian Ukrainian she knows all about the Russian Ukraine situation and so whenever people would speak up about the war she'd be like here's the thing that you don't understand about the Ukraine and somebody would say something else like here's the thing you don't understand about Russia because you could never know enough because she her family is from there so like and that's why. We have not put out a huge thing about Ukraine. We have not put out a huge thing about Israel and Palestine. So I cannot tell you. Somebody's going to know more and they're going to call you out. Literally, I, I can't. I'm not a, 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 you know, a professional on either of those situations. So I'm not going to say something. I will leave it to the professionals. That's not what you're going to get on this podcast. That is, you're so people do that all the time. Or like people, you know, they just expect you to know. I, oh, I think it's it's that like joke that like everyone on the internet knows everything and has never made a mistake. Like mm-hmm. everybody just expects you to know all of these random obscure things. You can't even comment on something without someone you know coming down your throat. Um, I think and- that th- also like what you were saying about um how I like people want people to be perfect rather than valuing them for the parts of themselves that are worthy of being honored and praised and seen. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that inherently is the big issue is we have wrong expectations. And when we have wrong expectations, we are going to have unsettled emotions. And then we are going to, if we, if we think that those expectations are okay to have, we are going to get bitter and bitterness is a real problem because bitterness is it's going to erode at the state of your heart and mind 100%. and it breaks people down and i and i can i can attest to this and you can probably think of somebody in your life who um this correlates to but have you ever met an older person who has a lot of bitterness towards people and have you noticed how their health is Whoa, I'm I literally I had someone come to mind and wow, yeah. Yeah. These people and, usually yeah. suffer from a lot of like bone density issues. Arthritis is huge among bitter people. This person I'm thinking of, I'm pretty sure that person, I'm not gonna say gender, that person has arthritis. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Arthritis is actually very, very common among older bitter people. So if if you think like, oh, I can be entitled to either being treated a certain way, um, ex- having certain expectations of others to be perfect, I didn't realize really I was quick, going to when I did this. I was going to say, are what you realizing there's balloons? balloons? <laughs> that's like the second time that's happened. Two. Is it two or is it I three? I don't know. Well, three do it. I don't know All what right. you, that's the second time. Well, let's just see what you're doing to trigger these balloons. We're going to find out by the end of this episode, we'll, we will figure out what, what creates balloons. Um, but, but if you but have yeah. those, those wrong expectations, then you are going to be incredibly dissatisfied. You're going to be bitter with other people. And, and don't call me when you are 76 and you are riddled with arthritis because I told you in the year 2024 that if you remained bitter towards people, especially because you had the wrong expectations of them, it's going to affect your health. It does. I That's something that I definitely have been, you know, working on myself. And I, I think I said this in the last episode, like it is so easy to get bitter with social media and seeing and hearing all these things that's going on kind of like what you said we're not supposed to see we're not supposed to see every major event i just really don't think humans were supposed to live like that Mm -hmm. um i think we've kind of far exceeded um anyway 
And I, it is so hard to not get bitter about things, but you have to not get like, I can even sometimes even now at like 29, I can see how that affects me. My emotions definitely affect my health. Like if I'm really out something really tiny, if I'm really stressing over something, I cannot sleep. And I think everybody feels that way. And I think that's just like the easiest, most tangible thing that we can see, or even women, like not to be, you know, too gross or personal, but like your period, when you are stressed, your period can go from like, your your cycle can go from like 32 days. I have a friend who um, was in the middle, like, I think she was like getting married, graduating, moving. And like, it was just a bunch of stuff happening. Her cycle was like 49 days. And like, that's not healthy. Like you're not, and you know, she's not sexually active or anything like that. It's not healthy. So we know that these things affect our bodies. And I want to, so I want to also add something or go back to something else you said when you were talking about, we're not supposed to see all these things. Like, and you talked about like on a global scale, I even think on a local scale, we see too much like on Twitter, I cannot see another um, deceased body. Like anytime something Mm. happens, people like post the videos and like, we're not supposed, like, I don't want to see it. And then, you know, there are people, we have to see this. No, you don't. I'm sorry. You don't. It's, it's, I, I agree. It's actually traumatizing to see it in person. So to traumatize others through seeing all of that, like, what do you think trauma does? Like, just, just think with me for a moment. What does trauma do? trauma creates a place for fear to take root in your life it's another route for stress anxiety which is what we were just talking about how um millennials and onward are the most stressed out generation Mm -hmm. even though we've had a lot like of different experiences like i didn't there i mean my great-grandfather fought on d-day in world war ii he still came back and ran a law firm and started the first uh low-income senior housing so don't tell me that I'm more stressed than than him. And he right, grew up during right. the Great Depression. <laughs> right. Like, 1912 lived right through that. He was a teenager during that time. And and to say like, oh, like we're we're dealing with a lot, like they dealt with it in person. Yeah. <laughs> and um and I think it's really cruel. It's so cruel to bring people into trauma they have nothing to do with because yeah. trauma affects your soul. Especially yeah. if someone is not in Christ, they don't have access to receiving comfort and healing from God because God is close to the brokenhearted. But if you're not going to God, if you're not aware of that, how are you going to get that broken heart healed? Because that's what trauma does is it breaks your heart. Yeah, This is a the ancient Hebrew way of of saying like trauma is broken heart. Yeah. And it really, oh, go ahead. And no, no, go for it. And I was just going to say, you're so right. It really does like break your heart. Cause I, there was a time where I, I've had to change. And like, if you guys were really into political Twitter, like 2020, 2021, 2022, like leave, like it has gotten so bad. There was a time I had to like unfollow a bunch of people. They were just posting all these people fighting and the people like bleeding out and all this other stuff. And like, see how bad the, and it's like, well, I don't need to see how bad the country is. I believe you that these things have happened. I believe, or, you know, when someone unarmed, black, white, Asian, whatever is shot, they always go, look, this unarmed person was shot. And it's like, I believe you. You don't have to show me. And it is traumatic. Now, obviously, you know, I'm not one of those people that's like, and I had to go see it there. You know, I I do think that the person who experienced it received the worst trauma. Like, let's, you know, but I do think there is something to say, like it is distressing. And if you see it constantly, I mean, the people, there's accounts that that's all they post. The people running those accounts probably have like the, I can't imagine like their hearts and like their countenance. Like it's so depressing. Mm -hmm. There's no, it's not necessary. And, you know, kind of take it back to the kids. I think that stuff probably is discouraging. You're seeing that all the time. You think that that's how the world is. Um, It's really, it's so important. And I mean this all my heart to touch grass. Like it is Mm -hmm. so important because once you leave like the social media realm, you see that there are people who are like normal. You see that like, even though, you know, your liberal neighbor is, you know, maybe they, 
they're whatever you're liberal you meet your liberal neighbor and you have a conversation and you know you know what my liberal neighbor literally does not want to kill me now does my liberal neighbor if we're online are they probably mad at me sure but they don't literally want to come over and like kill me but like if you're online like you think that every liberal person personally i i heard um a commentator say this like they personally hate you and it's like wait wait a minute they don't personally hate you but you're online all the time. You see all this, you get, and then you don't kind of really, you don't want to think about your future. You don't want to think about being innovative. You don't, there's, you know what? Like, I didn't think of that, but you're right. There's probably really creative people that could fix some issues. I'm trying to think of something like specifically, I can't think of anything specific, but there's probably some really creative and innovative people that could have fixed these issues. And, you know, they still might, God can heal their hearts, but they're just so, you know, bogged down by the world society everything that's going on and to like on what you're saying we've never been more distracted oh 100 percent. and 100%. i think obviously like with tiktok now like even my attention span is that of a nap many times i have to be very very intentional and, intentional and same I'm, I'm maybe the only person i know who actually really is intentional about the way that I think. And I'm like, okay, I'm getting distracted. I need to focus. I, I think a lot of people feel like they're being led around by their brain, like a, like a disobedient horse that keeps chomping on plants when you're trying to ride down a trail, <laughs> which did happen to me in Mexico. Um, <laughs> but but um, I, I think if we're so distracted then how can we expect to get things done? And if we have these attention spans and, and this reward system of like, we're able to get like this dopamine release from getting to the point of a video that takes less than 60 seconds, how are we going to have the stamina, the yeah. desire to persevere through a project that takes weeks, months, years, a lifetime? And I mean, because that's even, what a lot of businesses take. Yeah, a hundred percent. And even like setting up my website, like, I really need to redo my website. So I said, Saturday, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and just even thinking about like how long that's going to take, like even me as someone who I try, I really try not to spend too much time, but you know, there are moments where I do give in, but like, I try to be very conscious like you, like I try to be very conscious of that, but I'm just kind of like, Oh, this is going to take forever. But really like, you know, uh, I th like 16 year old me was like oh yeah let's do that and I was like super like oh who cares if it takes all day but now my I can see like my attention span is like less and like you know I don't say like more cynical but like you know you see life has changed a lot since then um mm -hmm. and there was one other thing I wanted to say I lost it what was the last thing you said um about being distracted or before that before being distracted i should have oh, we down. we were talking about attention spans um due to technology and then before that um you know what i guess it doesn't matter maybe it wasn't and like if it's her. important enough i'll remember it um but yeah i can't even remember the last thing i said Perfect example. Like, I'm, I should be able to remember the last thing I just said. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this is. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, And I can't other the last like really innovative tech thing I could think of is really like Uber, Airbnb, like that time. We have not had anything else really since then. I can't think yeah. of anything else. Do you remember Maybe, how? how we work was kind of disruptive at first to the industry and then it quickly folded that was funny yeah yeah we work has a a very interesting story i i didn't finish it but i started their little documentary thing that was and that could have been a really really good that was a good idea so many things that like turned out terrible were good ideas uh the Fernan girl with the turtleneck the deep voice you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. elizabeth Holmes, great idea great idea um didn't work out she's in jail now for those that don't know um but there's so many ideas that were like really good that just didn't, didn't yeah through. it's so important to innovate as you go and I think yeah <laughs> this isn't super relevant but I do think actually one of the best innovate as you go ideas that I've seen 
is how Kohl's made themselves an Amazon shipping shipment center, like a ship, like you can bring your Amazon returns to Kohl's. I did not know that. That's really smart because then you get people in the door and then they look around and they smell the smells and they look at the things and that was that was really smart. And I think also the putting the Sephoras and the Coles and the JC Penny also brilliant. That is smart because let me tell you, I can't think of a reason I would walk into Coles other than to drop off my Amazon. But if I'm already in there, then why not look around? That's smart. That is innovative. Yeah, you're right. Like you have to to stay relevant to keep your now we're a business podcast um, to stay <laughs> relevant um to keep your customer base to keep improving because like the idea is like every business is really supposed to improve humanity even the stupidest dumbest business that has ever been created the idea is really to improve humanity but to do that you do have to keep innovating you have to keep moving because the way i mean the last 15 years have gone maybe 20 years at this point, you gotta, I mean, we've seen so much growth. You gotta keep moving. Absolutely. Um, and, um, and hopefully this inspires some younger yeah. entrepreneurs to be less distracted and solve problems because we're capable of it. Um, and we've actually, if we, if we take into account the trauma that we've actually experienced versus what we've experienced secondhand, maybe we can give us a little bit of a um, realistic perspective about how stressed we should actually be. And I think I was be, about to careful, say perspective shift. be careful about what you take in and how much time you spend taking in news, because actually, I just learned this, your brain cannot tell the difference between a thought that like that you don't want to happen versus like you do want to happen. Like it feels like it's happening to it. So when you take in content that's not happening to you, it can actually, um, it can hurt your brain in a similar way to the way that experiencing something or it, it being something that you're remembering. Um, it, it has a, a similar effect on the brain. Yeah. And so we have to remember that we are fragile. Um, that our minds and hearts are fragile and it's actually wisdom to protect them and not comment on everything and not even know about everything. Because if we are able to keep our hearts and minds in a joyful and optimistic and um, feeling safe space, then we're actually going to be able to focus our energies on creating things that are going to help people and help the world. Yeah. And I, last thing on this topic, and I want to add, uh, to what you just said, I want to release everyone. You do not have to um, release a press statement on every world event or every in, uh, national event. You don't have to release a press statement. Every time something happens, people feel like you have to release some sort of statement on your opinion within the first like 24 hours. I want to release that from you. You don't have to do it. Um, and if you read, I do, I have that mindset with those are the girls. I used to, cause like, Technically, it's like news or whatever. Um, first of all, I prefer like doing Christian and like pop culture. Like that's especially nowadays. Like that's kind of more. I'd rather be the um, your escapism. But when it was a little bit more new, I used to be like, I got to be the first person to say something. And then, you know, I said something stupid. Sometimes it's OK. Just like don't say anything until you know more. And mm -hmm. it's OK. I wish more of us did that. I do. I really wish more of us kept our mouths closed and waited and then spoke. Um, but we really have to change or move on to the next topic. It's been 41 minutes. Um, this is so us. <laughs> it's so us. Um, I can kind of piggyback off. So when you were talking earlier, you said the comment about celebrities are not as rich as we think. Mm -hmm. I want to say this too. I, um, who created Honest? That was Jennifer Garner, right? No, that was company? Jessica Alba. Jessica Alba. So I was into a podcast and they made this point. Honest, huge brand, huge company. She's never in like the billionaire list, which is crazy because you would think how big it is, it would be billionaire status, but it's not. So celebrities aren't really as they seem. Mm -hmm. Similarly to what we're kind of want to talk about, we might do a separate episode that does a deeper dive, but there's like conversation around this topic. We want to talk a little bit about what was going on at Nickelodeon with mm -hmm. um, Dan, 
So I'll go ahead and say trigger warning now. I don't think we'll get like too into the weeds, but if you're like, you don't want to hear about this, or if you, if you think it's been talked about too much, don't worry. We're going to like touch other topics about it. But like, if it's just something you can't hear, you can go ahead and like fast forward and then go ahead and leave the five stars. So, (laughs) um, (laughs) um, we, Jamie's seen the first episode. I've seen all of them except for the one with Drake Bell. And for those who haven't seen it, I've just give like a quick kind of like overview and then we'll kind of discuss it and like a thought that I had. Essentially, I will. So I'll talk about the first episode specifically. And you can tell me your thoughts on this. It was all about Amanda Bynes and it made me feel really icky. She was not part of it. Like it felt like someone was telling her story without her permission. I don't know. She could have said, go for it. I And I know you can't tell you can't talk about Dan Schneider without talking about Amanda Bynes because it seems like it was a huge problem, but like it just, it focused a lot on Amanda Bynes and she wasn't interviewed and that just felt very icky. How did you feel about that? I I actually, I have a little bit of inside Hollywood knowledge for those of you who do not know or remember. I used to work with celebrities um, in LA and in New York city. I've done a a few jobs for Nickelodeon. Um, and so I know uh, people in this circle. And when it comes to Amanda, even people who don't personally know anyone connected can tell you that her parents have been very, very controlling for many, many mm. years of her life, of her adult life. And yeah. so uh, frankly, I'm actually not certain that she was able to speak. I'm sure they tried to reach her, oh. but I don't think they were successful. And I I don't know if anyone remembers, I think this was a few months ago where Amanda was found wandering the streets naked. Yeah, yes. Okay, so wh- why, why would that happen? Well, um, this is a pretty common prisoner technique that people will use. They will take your clothes so that you cannot escape. So that when you escape, you're either too embarrassed to escape. This is what they do to prostitutes, like uh, human trafficking victims. They will take their clothes to keep them in a brothel or whatever situation they're in so that either they can't escape, they'll be easily found, um, they'll be embarrassed. And uh, look crazy. Really, or look crazy. Or like how, you know, how hard is it to get somewhere without shoes? You know, I, I can barely walk in a nice soft grassy area without shoes on before I'm my princess feet over here needs to get back inside. (laughs) So, (laughs) so, um, judging by what I know about Hollywood, because it is for those of people that are like, it can't be as sinister as it seems. I worked in Hollywood. It's as sinister as they're making out to be and worse. Okay. Uh. So let's just take that off the table for those of you who are skeptics. Raise your hand if you've worked in Hollywood. Oh, your hand's down, mine's up. Okay, so <laughs> sit down. Um, but, but Amanda, and like I said, this is only a few months ago. She was in a situation where what it looks like to me um, that, that she was in a situation where she was trapped and whoever it was holding her did not want her to escape and so they took her clothes. If you wow. if you look at her, if you look the way she speaks, a lot of people have probably seen her on TikTok and on her podcast and a lot of people probably think, oh, like drugs or that's crazy. Let me tell you something. As somebody who's worked in Hollywood and has worked with people who are in these states of mind, what you are looking at is not a drugged out person. What you are looking at is somebody whose mind is broken. Mm. How do you break someone's so mind? Sad. You break it while they're young. And so there are clearly traumas that she experienced when she was young that were repressed, that she was disassociated from, that at some point reared its head and came out. And then someone probably tried to be like, shove that back in because we don't want that person exposed. We don't want to tell the story. But really what happens to a child, I've seen this happen over and over again to people in the industry and people outside of the industry. When they're, they look like this, when they speak like that, when they um, have difficulty thinking like that, every single time I can tell you what has happened is sexual abuse because yeah. nothing breaks a person like being sexually abused and nothing breaks a person like being sexually abused as a child. Yeah. So I have seen time and time again, actors who've dealt with this and regular people who have dealt with this when they seem oh it's two fingers it seems like 
<laughs> that the cause you might the have wound. to do like this specifically. Let me, let me see if I could. Nope, not three. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, but uh, it when I see this every single time, if someone is sexually abused as a child, what has happened to Amanda and what has happened to many other people is the effect that she has in her speaking in the way that she's able to comprehend and also in um and how she is able to be controlled by people who are more powerful than her and so when i see that amanda wasn't interviewed or wasn't a part of it i don't think that was her will i think that whoever is in charge of her be it her parents who are controlling her estate whatever it is i don't think she's allowed to speak out and I think we all also remember that she tweeted, this was several years ago, that Dan Schneider was the reason why she she could not have children. And it came out that um, there was somebody who Dan had worked with who um, was forced to have an abortion as uh, as a young, young teen or a child. Um, and many have suspected, and I don't know this for sure, many have yeah, suspected- Yeah, all alleged, Amanda. all alleged, anyone this listening, a, lawyers, alleged, continue. This is alleged, but, but as yeah. someone who's worked in Hollywood, who who has heard a lot of rumors in Hollywood, I can tell you that majority of the time when you hear a rumor in Hollywood, an allegation, but nobody's willing to actually sit, stand up and confirm it, usually it's true. And, yeah. um, and, and that's majority of the time. It's not like, you know, some places where there's like, like gossipy places that you may have experienced where it's a lot of lies. This is not the Southeast of America in Hollywood. <laughs> the rumors are true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe you. I definitely, I mean, which also, I wonder if she saw it. Cause like that could also be re-traumatizing. Like I, I hope she didn't see it. I, I really her Lindsay Lohan. Brit, you know, Britney Spears has my heart. Her, Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, and honestly, kind of Britney Murphy, RIP. Those women just, they always stood out to me. I don't know. I really Lindsay liked Murphy's them. Death was very suspicious. Very suspicious. I watched a documentary on that. Like, very suspicious. And, you know, another conversation we can have, but all of these older men with these young women. Like, you know, we see that. Well, we don't see it, but like, I at least I I had a friend in high school that was um 17 dating I think he was like 22 or something and we were like oh you know at 17 now I'm like that's I can't believe I was jealous of her like that type of thing um but like in hot like Brittany Murphy's husband was like 10 plus 10 20 years older than her and that's kind of I wouldn't say like super common but like that happens. Oh my goodness. This is kind of a side note. Did you see Aoki Simmons? Have you seen um her boyfriend? No, what happened? Oh my goodness. It it Jay, it is she's dating a 62-year-old. Now this girl is I think she's 21. Maybe let me just triple check. She is dating a but you know, and what's so sorry, just we're gonna go right back and talk, but I just wanna say like this is an example of and this is what's so sad. It's an example of like, uh, I saw someone say like generational trauma as well as like daddy issues. Cause you know, her mom dated or married or whatever they were when she was 17, I think. And Russell Simmons was like 40 something maybe. So she's doing what her mom was doing. And you know, they ha absolutely have daddy issues. There's Russell Simmons has, yeah, Russell Simmons. Russell Simmons? Yeah. Russell Simmons has a bunch of things going on. Allegedly, Diddy type stuff going on with him. But anyway, it's. I mean, that's Hollywood, I guess. Okay, yeah. She uh, is. And, yeah, and she's 21. Sorry. Unfortunately. And he's 65. Yeah. That, that sexual abuse in Hollywood, um, extremely common. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's really sad. You you haven't seen it yet, but like sometimes they have they had two parents on there. No, they had three three parents. Drake's dad, amazing guy, like ten out of ten, loves his son. The two moms, and you know, I I love moms. Like I'm not anti mom. The two moms, one of them was very like, um, okay, I'll I'll just spoil it. So spoilers if you haven't seen it. Um, in the second episode, they talk about, they were actually, so there were actually three pedophiles on the set of all that. 
So what's also crazy is like, except for the first and the last episode, we're pretty much about Dan. Is it wait Dan Snyder? Dan who's Dan Harmon? Um, Dan Schneider is the the producer writer. So Dan Harmon, I don't know who that is. Okay, Dan. Har- okay, sorry. Yeah, Dan Schneider. Oh, sorry, Dan Harmon does like Rick and Morty, but I'm, and I'm sure people get it mixed up, and he's probably like frustrated. Okay, Dan <laughs> Schneider. Um, so the first the first episode, like the last episode, were really about him, but the one in between were kind of about there were three pedophiles that actually worked for um, all that during that time. And one of them, uh, and this is the craziest thing you, you're going to ever hear. One of them became friends with this lady's daughter. And it was an older guy. He was in his 20s. I think he probably came off as like gay. And he was the person who was like, okay, mom, like talk with the moms and then bring the kids on to set and everything. Like came off as like kind of your gay. Like that was the vibe I got that people thought he was. So, you, you know, you're not suspecting anything. Well, he was actually a mm-hmm. pedophile and became friends with this woman's daughter and would hang out and all these other things well one day the girl got really upset the daughter got so upset she was mad about something she slammed her laptop shut and then ran upstairs because she was and the mom was like what's wrong what's wrong this disgusting man sent her daughter a nude and the woman goes I didn't know what to do. If I told the police, it could ruin her career. She could da 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 da. And she didn't tell the police. And that's just so like crazy to me that the mom, like the kid, completely understand. Anyone honestly under 18, whatever they, however they responded, they responded like, you know, because even, um, you know, people were upset with Josh Peck because Josh Peck isn't like, you know didn't wasn't part of the documentary he doesn't have any bad stories with dan Harmon, but we can't blame josh peck because he's a kid and the truth of the not dan Harmon. i'm so sorry dan Harmon, dan snyder um because the truth of the matter is how people like abusers can change like act one way to one toward one person another way to another person there's so many serial killers that their families were like, we had no idea. Oh, he's just such a sweet, lovey guy. Now there's some that everybody's like, oh, this is not shocking. But there are some that like, we had no idea. He was always a good father to our children. He would never hurt a fly. People can do that. And, um, but yeah, so anyway, so I oh, lost my train of thought thinking about people being fake like that. Um, so the mom, sorry. So back to the mom. So the mom just was like, um, oh, well, uh, I just, I didn't know what to do. So she never went back to the Nickelodeon set, but it's like, hello, you report, you, you report the pedophile that sent your child nudes. It's just, it was just so crazy. You guys, it was, it was a crazy documentary. I, I don't know if I saw, I think I saw the first episode where, um, there was a, a guy who had a similar job where he, it was found in his possession when the police, uh, went into his apartment that he had a pair of underwear. Yeah, that was the second episode. Seven, I think okay. you, you must have seen two then. Okay, so yes, I saw um, episode two then. That was the only episode I saw. So he was the one found with the um, uh, underwear of the seven-year-old girl. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I know about him and um, was it Brian Peck? Were, yeah, Brian were Peck. Covered in that episode. So that, that, was, that was wild. Yeah, um I am trying to find the um the Greek word actually I think this is worth finding cuz for those of yeah. you that know me know that um I can't get through anything without quoting a scripture. So um I just You need you find it and I'll I have another thing I want to comment on. Yes, you um, go on. So I like the biggest lesson i think in all of that is or like i guess not the lesson but like a a takeaway in all of this is we have to do better at protecting kids i don't think there's anything wrong of kids like acting and they want to be on a tv show um one thing that i want to talk about we'll talk about this after um jay finds the scripture is like we do kind of need younger 
shows. Like, if we think about the shows that are on now, that like, there's no iCarly's. Um, that's a bad example because of the situation we're talking about. There's no Hannah Montana's. Hannah Montana's so. I mean, look at the fashion. Look at how they dress. Look at the even the silly scenarios they were in. There's no Hannah Montana like show for kids these days but that we'll have that conversation in a second but anyway like i think the biggest takeaway is like we have to as a parent specifically you gotta be on top of what's going on because the thing is um it sounds like the people who do not have um some of the people who have really active parents they came out okay now, are there, were there people whose parents were active and they didn't come out? Okay, sure. You know, is it completely the parents' fault? The only person we can blame, the only person who takes full responsibility is the actual, you know, abuser. But parents absolutely need to take, they have to take some sort of responsibility. And it seems like people whose parents were really, really involved, they came out okay. I think about the girl from Spy Kids. She talks about that. Alexa I heard her Vega. on a podcast once. Yeah, Alexa Vega. Yes, I heard her on a podcast once say that because someone was like, "How did you? How are you so normal?" And like, she's a Christian, everyone, and she's super pro life. Just throwing that out there. Um, and they were like, "How did you come out like this?" And she said that her mom was like really, really involved. Like her mom made sure she was always there. And there was like another part in the episode where like um, when all the things happened with Brian Peck, he was the convicted pedophile and he's the person who abused Drake when um, like, I think it was like the day after he was arrested, um, all of the kids and their parents were in a room. And then some guy came in with like a cop or something and said, all the parents have to leave the room. We have to ask the kids a question. I don't understand how as a parent you, you get up like <laughs> But all the parents left. That is so crazy. I'm not a parent, so like, and I'm trying not to judge. But like, and this is in the that 90s is so crazy too. to me. So yeah. So now people are more aware of what goes on. True. But in the 90s, like I don't know if anybody grew up in the 90s or remember what it was like, but you felt really safe majority the of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, and okay, so then there's that aspect of it, like, like some of the things. Or even like some of the jokes that they had on the show, I would it until they laid it out. Some of them I even was like, oh, I didn't realize that was sexual. There was a lot of things that you just you're so innocent. Most of us, I think, are so innocent. You just or you're not thinking about you don't see. It's these actual perverts who they're perverts and they're porn addicts, which they didn't get into that, but that is a huge role of it. Mm -hmm. There was oh the part where um the one of the writers was saying how dan um schneider was like oh um why don't you pretend to he said something like why don't you pretend to bend over this table and i'll pretend to like hit like smack you or like you pretend like you're something sexual and everybody's like what that's something from porn like these people like it warps your brain it really does and that's you know another episode but yeah just and I that th in there i think too there's like this lie that people will put out about whether it's the porn industry or the sex industry that oh if people had a way to like feed these desires in um, a way that was legal then it would keep them from doing all this crazy stuff that's not true um and that's also something that's been disproven by um studies and by practice but really like what you eat, what you feed yourself with, you begin to crave. And anybody who mm -hmm. has repeatedly eaten the same type of food and you know that when you get hungry, you're like, oh, I, like you're thinking of the food that you usually eat. You're not thinking like, I want to have some food I've never tried before. Right. And it's the same thing with your mind. So you're feeding your mind sexual perverted trash. You're going to start thinking sexual perverted trash things and any anybody who also has ever been in a relationship with someone who had a porn addiction knows how bad your sex life is because they are getting off on what they've seen and not what actually really gives people pleasure but what actually looks good on camera or like good on camera so um yeah it's it's pretty clear that the way that they think and their expectations are on set has been very much shaped by porn mm, brian peck 
Like, they just came off as such nice, sweet, oh, fun guys. And they're, like, disgusting, like, deviants. I mean, bled into so many other aspects of the life. Because, like, he was getting the underwear from the girls. He was writing about it in his journal. I mean, Brian Peck was, like, not a nice guy. Like, it's just so many other things. That's that's very interesting and how it's all connected. And it is interesting, too, like, people who are involved in these kind of lifestyles, like, even if, like, just, like, it always comes out in some way. Like, I cannot believe I didn't pick up on that pickle joke as a kid at all. Like, went right yeah. over my head. I had no idea. The, that That was one of the things I was saying earlier. I was like, there were things I was watching. Well, I will say this. I never thought it was funny because that's just not my humor. But there were parts that I was watching even on the show as like an adult. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That is that. Like, even the Ray Romano thing. Like, if I didn't know we were talking about, like, if I didn't know the context was like, this is going to be something sexual, I don't know if I would have picked up on it. Mm-hmm. Like, um, it's just, uh, Ray Romano wasn't a pervert or anything. I just want to say that. He just was in an episode and um he did a gag and i think that like he i i really don't think like especially because like in the context of this is a children's show why would there be anything sexual in the children's show you're not thinking that um Mm. or even like the the water bottle um on when um i'm sure you've seen the clip where cat's laying on the bed and she has a water bottle she's putting on herself like i just thought this silly girl she's so silly and dumb but I mean, within the context of like, oh, this is sexual, like, yeah, yeah, and um, I, I think it's it's really interesting because, like, at some point, like these people like cannot hide themselves or control themselves. Like when they feel comfortable, it just comes out. Yes. Like, I said this before. There's no HR department in Hollywood. Yeah, but people don't get caught while you are coming up in your career if someone has a position of power like you just kind of have to do whatever to either hopefully stay under the radar with certain people and get hired by the good ones or or just kind of keep quiet until you get to a point where you're powerful enough that people believe you because people aren't going to believe an intern that tells a a story as much as they believe somebody who has something to lose yeah after with a career and so um I mean, I've even seen uh, PR people like they they tell like their actor clients who are married or um, and they're and they're flirting with someone and they they will say to them, like, look, if you're going to cheat on your wife, if you're going to do something stupid, be at least smart. Don't do it with the intern. Don't do it with somebody who's got a low level job has nothing to lose. Do it with somebody who if this came out, they would be damaged by that, too. And that is how, yeah. And and, and unfortunately, like that's, that's what happens because these people are like, they've, they've been kind of conditioned into getting everything they want. And so that kind of situation creates a monster. It, It creates a person who thinks I can have whatever I want, whenever I want it. And that's what you have in Hollywood is people who are in these positions of power, who, if you are messing with someone who it would damage their reputation for anything to come out or you have their career at least partially in your hands you're gonna have a lot of silent people and you're going to be able to do what you want to do yeah and that's why dan and a lot of other people who have been and have yet to be caught got away with things for so long because people don't believe them and it's not worth speaking out and I even yeah. think now, like what Corey Feldman, people are finally starting to believe him about what he said about the abuse that he experienced. Corey who? Feldman? I think it's Corey Feldman because he was friends Let with Corey Hyam, who I think may have killed himself. Um, oh, wow. But he, he was very outspoken about um, being abused. Um, and he, oh, yeah, it was Corey Feldman. I was correct. Um, oh, wow. He, I didn't. Oh wow. I would I would definitely recommend looking into his interviews because he's been talking about the sexual abuse in Hollywood for a long time and people have really only just started to validate what he was saying. Um and he was actually um interviewed I think it was by TMZ on the street about 
quiet on set. And he was really happy that they were speaking out about it because for so long, he was the only person who was willing to speak out. He was like, this is an industry of pedophiles. And he said that. Um, He's also one of the people that said that um, Michael Jackson never abused him. And he didn't believe that Michael Jackson actually was the pedophile in the situation, Um, but that he was allowing children to sleep in his room to protect them. Oh, that's interesting. And McCulkey, he said Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson never did anything to him either. That's interesting. The protection thing. I heard through like, I don't even like a, I want to say on Joe Rogan, um, that he was like castrated. So he didn't even have like sexual feelings. Now, I don't know how true that is. Wow. But, I didn't know that one. Yeah. I heard that he was like, to keep his voice low, mm. they castrated him, his pair, which oh, back to like abusing yeah. children. Yeah. Or sorry, to keep it high. Yeah. Back to abusing children to uh, get money. So that's what I heard. This is all alleged, alleged, alleged. Wow. Um, I heard. So he didn't even, he just was messed up that like he thought, these children were his friends but that's interesting the protecting him protecting the kids i don't know i, I don't know enough about the situation i just I'm pretty know things sure heard. around that time he was also trying to um get the legal ownership of his music and what uh-huh. what will often happen is when people who are musicians who have an extensive catalog try to get the legal ownership of their music to be just them and not owned by the label for those of you who don't know if you are a musician you record with a label, you don't own the rights to your songs that you've written and recorded. And even some, t- some contracts will say that you, they own you for a certain amount of time, which is why when people were like, oh, why did JoJo go away for so long? She didn't really have a choice because the label that she was signed to owned her for X amount of years. Anything that she wrote, anything that she released either had to be released through them or wouldn't be released at all. And so if Kesha she ro- too. wrote a record, yeah, Kesha, exactly. So she wrote a recorded during that time. Um, she it would be theirs and they could squish it. This happened to another friend, a a friend client of mine. Um, She had a whole um, album that Columbia is like keeping under wraps. Like it's, it's heartbreaking because I love the recordings of some of these songs and some of them she's re-recorded, but there's nothing like the way it was recorded at that time because it was supposed to come out in that time. Yeah. And those recordings are lost forever because Columbia just owns them and owned her for X amount of years. And that's crazy. um, so what will happen with these artists who want to buy back their catalogs because they maybe own like 10% or something of the of the sales, the proceeds from whether it's streamed or used in a film or a commercial, whatever, like 10% ownership of their song, most of their uh, ownership is to the label, um, publishing companies. And so My- Michael was trying to get, if I, if I recall correctly, and this one you can actually feel free to to correct me about if you do know, but around the time that all of this went down, he was trying to buy his music catalog back. The other person that tried to do this also unsuccessfully was Prince. Around the time that he tried to buy the rights to his music to get that back, he died. And as far as I know, the only musician who's really been successful at this was Taylor Swift. And, um, and that, I just have to say, if you're, able to fight the machine you may actually be working with the machine Ooh, another you are spicy tonight that's another spicy take i'm spicy all the time we just don't talk enough (laughs) fair fair we should do this more and catch up um more i so we're at an hour 15 i don't i'll maybe go another five minutes because i want to get your i really want to get to the other part that i was talking about earlier um, cause I want to get your take. So what I was saying earlier is, um, the reality. So it's like, what, where do we go from here? How do we make children's television? How do we give children that like acting and have all this talent? How do we, what do we do for those kids? Like the ones in the future. And a lot of people are saying, we don't have, ho- we'll just give them all out of Hollywood. We don't need kids to be in shows. But I say, this is my hot take. I say pause, we actually kind of do. Let me explain a little bit more. So I actually saw a really good video essay. If I can find it, I'll link it. It was about how the tween tween girls are have 
they disappeared. We no longer have tween girls. And this is very true. You can go outside, go to your local, I was gonna say your local mall, but they're not there either. Go outside and go to your local high school, um, you know, with the permission, you know, get the, <laughs> that anyway. Your local high school and you'll see that we no longer have tween girls. And a huge reason I think is because of social media. When you are, you know, if you should, I personally think you should be on TikTok at 10, but let's say you, you know, parent gives their kid access to TikTok at 10. You're not going to follow, sure you'll follow your fellow 10 year olds, but you're not going to follow a 10 year old celebrity. You're going to follow celebrities from your favorite shows. Well, what shows are you watching? You're watching things like Riverdale, unfortunately, maybe not at 10, but like, well, actually maybe at 10, you're watching Riverdale, you're watching Euphoria. These are all the teen shows right now. Okay. Oh God. I, I needed a palate cleanser after one episode of Riverdale. It was so dark that I actually, when I had a friend who was watching it and I was watching it with her, um, in order to actually keep up and be able to talk to her about it, I would watch, after watching one episode of Riverdale, I would have to watch two episodes of Fuller House to like that's so cleanse. funny but I'm yeah I, I finished Fuller House before I was able to get through two seasons of Riverdale because I needed so much palate cleansing yeah Riverdale like get okay so like the first season is dark because it's true crime but I feel like it isn't as like you know sexy it's like season two through the end where it's like and especially toward the end because they were they aged them up finally and i think um it was around the time it started to get a little loosey-goosey with like all the rules on tv it just got to be like you know i'm fast forwarding like come on i i why are we having sex right now this has nothing to do with anything like it started just to get really bad but my my thing is though like there should be no like nobody in high school middle school, they shouldn't be watching that but they don't have any they don't have the hannah montanas they don't have the um Kim Possibles. They don't have those. So what they're doing is they're watching them. And then the thing that's really hard is like, I I think the girl who played Betty was so beautiful. I think uh what's her name? Lily Reinhardt. Oh yeah. Gorgeous She's woman. Gorgeous. And she looks a lot like Brittany Murphy. She does, she does. And Brittany Murphy was beautiful. Um but the thing is, she's 25. So she's going to have a 25-year-old body. She's going to have 25-year-old skin. She's going to have 25-year-old curves. At, I'll even say 16, even though she was playing a 16-year-old, you're not going to look like um, Lily Reinhardt. Not only are you not going to look like Lily Reinhardt, the scenarios on Riverdale were so ridiculous. Um, Veronica ran a speakeasy in high school. I'm sorry, that's so unrealistic. Archie went to jail and played football and then in jail against like another jail. And then his former high or his high school cheerleading team came to cheer them on through the fence. Like these aren't real scenarios. Now, granted, most of the scenarios on Hannah Montana, like, you know, we're not pop star. Well, some of you are. I was. No, I'm just joking. Um, you know, we most of us were pop stars at night, high schools by day. But we all could relate to having a crush on someone and like getting a little nervous when we spoke. Like there was just, it's just so much more tame, but we don't have shows like that. And part of it is we also don't have like, and Hannah looked 16 because she was 16 when she played someone 16. So these girls are looking up to these people who have that. And anyway, my whole point being is like, I don't think that we should be getting rid of um, like, kids working in Hollywood all together I think we need to do better you know what show did really well affects. at this was Degrassi and the way that Degrassi yeah agreed all, if you look at all the Degrassi kids all grown up none of them look like they've been essayed or um they're really messed up um which and is I've very met, interesting because they had some really kind of dark things they had racy stuff going on that show I, I to the point where I'm like I don't even really want to rewatch this like the first episode <laughs> was yeah was, Emma as like I think she was like 13 years old uh, meeting up with a pedophile that she met online who was posing as a 13 year old boy yeah first episode yeah. in yeah out the gate right uh, out the gate <laughs> but um and I've met some of these people um and and I, they they're pretty stable people but what I, I will say oh, that Degrassi did right that I think actually helps a lot was that it was such a 
um, a cast show. There wasn't like a lot of work being pushed out of one person. And I know when Miley talks about working on Hannah Montana about how much work it was and how much coffee she had to drink and um, just like what a difficult, and I've worked in film. God, it's so difficult. I don't know why anybody would want to do it. Um, It's just (laughs) physically demanding, even when you're not the star of a show. And so I think what, what Degrassi did really right is they are not asking a lot of their actors because they have so many of them. And that episode was like really mostly Emma, Manny, JT, and they worked a lot in that episode. And then like the next episode will maybe be more about Ashley and, um, and Jimmy. And so then, and Terry, like those are the actors that are, yeah. And, and you'll still see the other actors, but they're not in the A storyline all the time. The, the characters yeah. that are in the A storyline change up every episode. And then some are more in B and C storylines. And sometimes you don't see them at all because they have such a large cast. So nobody's getting overworked. And I think that's a, a big key to um, successfully doing a, a kid's show with kid actors. And the other thing I would say is we just need to be better about the way we treat parents who want to be on set with their kids. I think there's so many negative connotations in the industry that unfortunately can be really true, like because you have momagers that actually don't know the industry very well. But then, of course, Ariana Grande had a momager and we see how that worked out. She actually pushed her daughter as far as I've heard, allegedly, allegedly pushed her daughter into doing whatever she needed to do whatever she needed oh, to do no. to get where she is. So her mom, as oh, far wow. as I've heard, allegedly encouraged that. So um, oh, unfortunately wow. you will see um, parents and Amanda Bynes' parents obviously no help either because they've been a part of keeping her um, controlled and silent as yeah. well. So, and uh, Jeanette McCurdy, she had that whole book about her mom. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I think on, on one hand, I'm, I would like to see because I've been on Nickelodeon sets with parents and the parents have been I've always had um, good experience, like annoying experiences, but like the parents are good. They're just like they don't know what's going on. They slow down the process. It does cost money to have them there. It does slow down everything. So that's unfortunate. And there's a lot of incentive to get parents off the set just from a professional perspective. And that's why people want to have shows like Riverdale where, oh, let's not deal with parents at all. Let's just have adults play kids. Um, yeah. which is really great for those of us who walk around in our late twenties, early thirties. And then, um, people older than us think we're teens and it's because that's the representation. So right, thank you, Hollywood. Right. That is, yeah, that's helpful for us. No, but, no, you no. Know, the youth are struggling, <laughs> <laughs> but definitely not worth the, the not having uh, role models for kids. Um, but yeah, I, I, from an interesting standpoint, I can tell you like, keeping parents off the set is not always a creepy control thing. It's actually parents do hold up a lot. And some of them are partners in the process in a negative way. Um, But I do think it should be um, easier to bring protective parties with you on set. But Mm -hmm. there also needs to be a way to regulate that because like I said, it slows the set down. It costs a lot of money um, to have the, the production slowed down. I've actually seen it happen. So it does happen. And that's why people don't want them there. But there needs to be a better structure put in place so that that can be um, present. And um, I didn't get to say this earlier. We were talking about um, Quiet on Set. But apparently, um, I don't know if they said this in the doc, but the person who encouraged Drake Bell to speak up about his abuse was his girlfriend's parents at the time. And the girlfriend was Fifi Dobson. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, when they said that, I was like, and I, I was, oh my goodness, I, wow, that's so crazy. I but they're not even back in the day. Are they even friends right now? Gosh, she had a she had a banger album in the early two thousands. But that's a parent that could that was on set that was helpful. So even if one parent is being not so helpful, at least there are other parents around. So it should be easier to have protective parties around and not just one person looking out for the the kid as well. So I think those are those are my two suggestions find a way to make it easier for parents to be there but not too involved because they slow the set down and an ensemble cast shows with the a storyline switching up who the the mains are yeah i think that's a good idea and i think uh, we'll and then we really have to wrap up the only thing is and that the ensemble thing will help because because there's so many people, the kids aren't going to get as much time, so they're not going to get paid as much. And it's going to help with those parents that are really 
because like that's the other problem with um the pressure of kids doing this is like some of these kids are paying their parents bills like there's no reason a you know a 12 year old should feel the pressure of like running their household so i Mm -hmm. think if they're not getting paid as much you're gonna it's gonna deter parents to like forcing their kids to do this all because they you know it's probably just because i think that was one of the things they said like people on the grass they didn't really didn't make that much i was just like fun spending money but they got to do something that they enjoyed and i think that's the thing that i'm like if they're good at it and they enjoy it why not it's just it has to be in a good positive environment and you got to keep your eye on them and i wonder if there's a way they could get parents to like go through a class to, well i mean i guess sometimes though like a parent's gonna parent um but yeah is there anything else you want to add I think that's all I can think of to fix the situation. Um, But I definitely agree with you. We need to see actual kids um, and also those actual kids styled correctly and go through a, a change as far as when you do grow up that, um, that coming of age part of their journey where they, they do so appropriately. I think maybe Degrassi did not do that so well when it comes to Manny Santos. Um, (laughs) But... (laughs) But um, I, I, they did it in a very authentic way, um, and I like that they they didn't go as overboard as they could have. Um, it I was, was going to say it could be a little bit worse, but yeah, it she, was, she was unfortunately a lot there. very realistic. So yeah, but I think a lot of the characters aged really well and went through their little changes you go through um, as you grow up, like Ashley going from like the popular girl to the goth girl um, yeah and then it's kind of like an alterna scene girl um and based on like basically how her peers accepted her so i think there's a lot of ways that you change and that you go through phases as a kid that were done really well on that show and they don't all have to be sexualized it can really yeah. be just about finding yourself and um so yeah i think honestly maybe just call up Canada for one of the few things they can contribute to the world and get their <laughs> notes on how they did Degrassi. <laughs> yeah. Anyone, any producers listening that want to do kids shows, that is our suggestions. Mm-hmm. Well, Jay, thank you so much for coming on. This was a great episode. A little lengthy, but I mean, that that's how we so normally us. do things. Yeah, that's just, that's just how we do things. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode, if you thought it was really spicy, if you're just like, um, yeah, I don't, I really don't know how you were triggering those balloons. It happened like three times. I thought it was that. I don't know. Um, (laughs) maybe it was words you were saying. Well, I don't even remember what we were talking about. Um, but yeah, so Thank you guys for listening. Um, Leave a review if you enjoyed this, if you thought it was really spicy, if you're like, oh, some of these things I totally agree with. If you're like, oh, I don't really agree with everything. Some of the things, like, let us know. If you have fun, fresh ideas on how to get the youth to not be crazy, um, that's good too. If you have an entrepreneurship idea that you think is really great and exciting, don't tell us. Go and do it. You don't want Mm -hmm. someone else to steal it. You go do it. You be that person. If you are one of the billionaires listening, I'd love an investment in the podcast. Um, I guess that's it. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And if you are um, happy with anything I said or mad at me, you can find me at Happy and Holy Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, Please don't let anything I said. I know I was really um, spicy and divisive, but I have many personal experiences as to why. Um, so do not hold that against Mal. Um, if if you are looking to complain to me directly, you can find me at my podcast with my best friend, Wenny. Um, we are at happy and holy co on most social media platforms, happy and holy TV on YouTube. And, um, you can find us at happy and holy co.com. So all complaints or, um, compliments, please send them directly to me and give Mal five stars. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. And I'll link all of her social media um, so you guys can follow her and follow and follow the podcast as well. All right, everybody. Have a great day, night, evening, however, wherever you're listening. Bye.